I must say. I want to thank the faculty of IBS Pune for giving me this TEDx platform. I'm very happy to be here this morning with all of you. Hi, I am Rasika Reddy and I'm a horse breaker and a horse whisperer. Essentially, what I do is I'm a kindergarten teacher for horses. But before we get to all that, I want to tell you a little story about how a woman like me, 20 years back, gets to becoming a horsebreaker. So let's start right at the beginning. I was born in 1967. Okay, stopped mental gymnastics. <laughs> I'm 57 years old. Uh, my father, Major Sharad Kane, an army man, and my mother, Kavita, they gave my sister, Sangeeta, and me an absolutely wonderful life. A solid education, lots of opportunities, and most importantly, uh, the belief in ourselves that we could do and achieve whatever we had set our hearts on. I started riding, luckily, at a very early age. The first time I ever got on a horse was when I was six years old. But I remember it like it just happened yesterday. That dark color of that pony and her name was Jungle Queen. Uh, I really felt like I was in heaven, born to be in that saddle. When I was around 12 or 13 years old, I had a bad crash of a horse during my riding lessons. Um, my mother rushed me to the hospital. Uh, it was discovered that uh, I have broken my tailbone. I was in a lot of pain, but all I could think of was how am I going to get to the riding school tomorrow? And that's when I heard my, uh, the doctor tell my mother that um, Ma'am, you have to keep this child in bed rest and very far away from those horses. And I nearly died. I thought this is end of life as I know it. But you know what my parents did? They never kept me away from those horses. Because they knew what that meant to me. And I think at that point of time, they gave me the roots to grow and those wings to fly with. Well. I didn't know it back then, but my absolute all-consuming passion for horses was actually going to be a catalyst for practically all the major milestones in my life. Uh, when I turned uh, 21, I was introduced to my husband, Dr. Ravi Reddy, who is a veterinarian who specializes in breeding horses. Now, what are the chances? What <laughs> luck, right? But ours was an arranged marriage because of horses, right? <laughs> well, um, we got married in 1988 and uh, I moved to Bangalore where my husband and his family, they ran a stud farm. There, of course, you know, I helped my husband with his veterinary practice. I rode horses on the farm with my father-in-law. I learned to cook from my mother-in-law and life was going on. And then in 1992, we became parents to our son, Arnav. Well, at this point, life was carrying on pretty well. But then in 1994, it took a very sudden sharp turn. And uh, this is where the next stage of my life starts. My husband took up a job offer to come to Pune and run a stud farm here for a gentleman called Mr. Dhanji Boy. Well, this farm was, this new farm was very modern for its time and the first farm in India to start uh, breaking in young horses on the farm before they were sent off to the race course to their trainers. And me on my part uh, started riding those young horses as a part of the breaking in process. 
Now, we had one professional rider who was working with us over there, and <coughs> he told me that uh, I should <coughs> ride on the racetrack because he thought that I had what it took to ride over there. So that is what I did. In 1996, I applied for my license to ride as a track work rider on the Pune race course. Now, what is track work and what is track work rider? Track work is the exercise and the training that is given to horses on the racetrack to get them ready for the races. And, uh, and the person who carries out this work of riding is called a track work rider. So that's what I started doing. And then the jockeys, they ride them in the actual races, right? Well, you know, race horses can be very highly strung. They can be very mercurial. And um, in the process of riding them, you can have accidents. So I've had my own share of accidents. Um, but I wear these broken bo bones as a badge of honor because I really do believe that you have to be very privileged to ride a horse. Well, in 2001, after five years of being a track work rider, I decided to apply for my jockey's license to ride as a professional jockey in the races. I sent in my application to the race club. They accepted it. And I had to go through the due process of riding in four test races, or as we call them, mock races. I did go through that process. But here, my friends, I would have to tell you that I never got that license. That license was denied to me. Well, the senior steward of the club called me up. And over the phone, he told me that he can't give me the license. I asked him why. He wouldn't tell me. Um, I asked him to give it to me in writing. He wouldn't. He refused to do that. You know, at that point of time, if he had just told me that uh, you don't make the cut professionally, I would have agreed and gone home. But even that didn't happen. But what I did get to hear from the grapevine, of course, is that this is happening to me because I'm a woman, I am a wife, a mother, and this race riding is way too dangerous for me. Okay? Well, yes, being a race jockey is a dangerous profession. We all know that. We've had jockeys. Jockeys have lost their lives riding on the racetrack. They too were sons, husbands, fathers, breadwinners for their families. But this can hardly be the reason that you can give professionally to somebody for denying them a vocation that they choose for themselves, right? Well, that's what I thought. But what do you know? Here I was, hands tied. Uh, I had worked very hard to achieve this dream of mine. Um, I had brought my weight down to <coughs> 47 kilos. You have to be a certain weight and a certain size to ride uh, as a jockey. Well, um, I was actually very devastated at this point of time, so much so that um, I was so depressed that I couldn't even drag myself out of bed I felt like a huge cloud had fallen over me. I felt really manipulated. I felt humiliated through this process. And um, the press, um, well, they were asking questions because they had been uh, following my journey and reporting on it and waiting for me to ride my first race. So when they asked me, I couldn't tell them anything. And the club, they wouldn't tell them anything. Family and friends were making all the right sounds, saying all the right kind things to me, you know, that um, it's all right, Rasika. Everything happens for the best. 
But no, for me, it was all over. It was the end. After about one month of licking my wounds in solitude, feeling sorry for myself and everything, I thought to myself one day, it's the world of horses that has dealt you this blow, not the horse. And I am not going to allow this one institution and this one license to dictate to me what the rest of the journey of my life will be. Because I knew what a special connection I had and I always had with horses. I also knew that I was not born to just ride horses. I was born to do much more with them. And in that moment of absolute clarity, I knew exactly what I had to do next. I knew what I had to be. <laughs> I had to be a horse breaker and a horse whisperer. Well, now you may ask me this question. What is all this breaking and whispering? And why is it important? Well, uh, let's get into all that now, OK? So I'm going to explain this to you using an analogy. I'm sure each one of you here has gone to a play school or a preschool where you learned the basics to set you up to go to the first standard, right? Well, what if your parents, they just skipped this whole process? They never sent you. They sent you straight to first standard. And now you're sitting there, and the teacher is asking you to write long sentences. But you can't. What would your reaction be? Would you be frightened, confused, sad? Would you have a fight or flight reaction to your situation? Well, that is exactly what can happen to young horses if they are not given the right start, the right base from, the, from where they can move on, the right breaking in process. If you don't, if you don't, um, if you don't go through this process with them, or if you mess up this process with them, you could actually end up having horses that are dangerous to themselves or to their handlers and their riders. When a young two-year-old horse comes to me for breaking in, it is fully grown in size, a 500 kg animal. But it is immature, it is juvenile, no experience. So when I start my process of breaking in, I have to start with introducing them to different equipments which they have never ever experienced before. <coughs> One of the first steps is introducing them to a bit. A bit is a piece of metal that goes into a horse's mouth. A horse's mouth is, a very, is very delicate, it's very sensitive. And this process is critical and very important. The next step is to get them accustomed to a saddle. And then the final step is to get them to allow a rider on their back. Now that, my friends, can sometimes be a very interesting thing to watch. <laughs> a lot of spills and a lot of falls and all that kind of thing. Well, I'm telling you all this in a nutshell, but obviously it is a long, drawn out, complicated process um, taking days. When I go through this process with the young horses, I have to gain their trust, I have to gain their respect. It cannot happen otherwise. You know how in one classroom you have different types of kids. Uh, they're never on the same level, either academically or otherwise. You have one kid that's the classroom clown disrupting everybody. Then you have another one who's brilliant and smart, but just won't put in the hard work, you know? Then you have another one who's a little timid. You know, the one who's not so timid. Well, in 
horses, young horses, it's exactly the same. In one group of horses that I get at a time, you have so many different characters and individuals. And I have to make sure that I don't treat each one exactly the same. No cookie cutter process. One style fits all, doesn't work. You have to change up your method, your technique. And that is exactly what I do during my process. Well, now coming to the horse whispering part of it. There's a gentleman from America called Mr. Monty Roberts. Many, many, many years back, he developed a method using horses in their natural environment and in the wilderness, and how they lived, how their nature was, how the nurture was. They need to be herd animals and to cling together for safety. And he used all this history of horses and then formed a method of training, which he called natural horsemanship, and then made famous across the whole world called horse whispering. Horse whispering is definitely not doing goose puss, goose puss in a horse's ears, because that really could be very, very annoying for a horse, don't you think so? But uh, now that I knew exactly what I wanted to do and what I wanted to become, my next step was how? How was I going to get there? Because none of this was here available in this country to learn which meant that I had to go somewhere overseas, which is far, which is prohibitively very expensive. And of course, the other thing, leaving behind a 10-year-old, a house, home, husband, was never going to be easy. It was always going to be a challenge. And I was finding different ways and methods of trying to get over all these hurdles. And sometimes I would really think that, am I going to get there? Is this ever going to happen, you know? And that's when <coughs> something special happened. You know that uh, dialogue from Shah Rukh Khan's movie, Om Shanti Om? Sorry, Shah Rukh, but I'm just going to try. Agar kisi cheez ko dil se chaho, to puri kainat us cheez ko tumar tum se milne ki koshish mein lag jati hai. Which means that if you really want something from your heart, the whole universe can conspire to get that for you. That is when a friend of ours, Dr. Huntington from Australia, put me in touch with a very well-known horse breaker in Australia called Julian Welsh. And Julian, he agreed to take me on as a farmhand and as his rider. And in return, he would teach me and I could apprentice with him for free. Can you imagine? It was a windfall, a complete win-win situation. On my way to Melbourne on that plane, I thought to myself, how on earth did I get the reins of my life back in my hands to guide my own destiny where I wanted to go? But it's happened, and here I am. But well, all that's very good. Now it was time to work and work I did. There in Australia, the world of horses is a bit different from here in India. You know how in India we have lots of people to do lots of things for us? And the horses, of course. But out there, there's nobody. You have to do every last thing for yourself. And this do-it-yourself culture taught me a lot. It gave me a lot of experience. I got to work with horses hands-on, one-on-one, deal with different types of horses in different situations. And that gave me the confidence. And that is when I knew that I could really do this job. I could deliver on this job. When I came back to India, I came back with the confidence that, yes, you know that confidence that comes from jumping through hoops and going against all odds? That well, when I came back, I really hit the ground running because that very first year, I um, registered my company, Basque Training Center. The same year, I got my first contract to break in horses for a stud farm. 
owners and trainers, they showed interest in my work. They gave me their horses to train. You know what uh, my uh, team and me, we do, is never something that hits the headlines. We are never the ones in the winning circle, holding trophies and you know all that. But and we are like oh, the background extra dancers kind of thing. So. But um, what we do gives us a lot of satisfaction. Because when we see those horses that we have worked with win races, and sometimes against all odds, it's truly very satisfying. Um, I, I really do believe that um, if you convert your uh, passion and your dreams into your life's work, the chances of true happiness and success are very, very high. As I told you, horses are like 500 kg animals, but you don't need to be a brute-sized person of root strength to, to deliver the work with them or train them. What you need is sensitivity, understanding, and of course, the right technique. And I have developed my own technique over the last 20 years, and it's my life's mission to teach this technique to as many people as possible so that these beautiful animals can be treated with dignity and care. I have a lot of young people who come and work with me, who apprentice with me, and who learn. And I do hope that they carry on this good work even I, after I have hung up my boots. Uh, mine has been a very wonderful journey. And through that journey, I have met very interesting horses. And I think those horses have been a huge part of who I am today and why I am here today. You know, they say that each one of us has a spirit animal that is our alter ego. Well, do you know who I think my spirit animal is? I truly believe it is the Pegasus, that horse with wings. In conclusion, I would like to say this to you. Himmat te madda, madad de khuda. God helps those who help themselves. <laughs>